you know, we didn't do an evaluation form or anything for this, but we are um, very interested in your feedback. Um, a couple of years back, EMS started trying to do these uh, live stream sites. Uh, it's added a little bit new life to EMS. Um, Dr. Nari Santos uh, is going to be the new uh, vice president for EMS. Uh, and so we're trying to think how EMS can grow stronger. Uh, we'll share a little bit later in the last uh, session. Um, EMS and Lausanne Movement Canada is trying to uh, reinvent itself. Lausanne, you all, most of you are aware of, uh, is uh, very much got an international presence uh, of recent uh, years. It's more being Toronto-centric and uh, we're trying to move the Lausanne Canada movement uh, throughout Canada and, and seeing perhaps a potential uh, link between EMS conference and Lausanne um, both looking at uh, missiological issues, EMS more from the academic uh, side of things, Lausanne more from the reflective practitioner side of things, uh, and uh, we're hoping that we can develop stronger partnerships uh, together in that. So with that uh, as an intro, I'm going to ask Dr. Nari Santos uh, to come up, and uh, Rainer, are we live stream? Okay. This is good. Uh, Pastor Nari, come on up here. I've got um, a very brief um, welcome here from uh, the outgoing Vice President Mark Naylor. Uh, I'm just going to read it. Um, uh, Mark says, on behalf of the outgoing EMS uh, VP of Canada Region, I would like to welcome you, Dr. Nari Santos, as the new EMS VP as of midnight tonight. And uh, I am encouraged by your enthusiasm and credentials in taking on this position and trust that uh, God will use you to further the cause of God's mission uh, through the work of EMS in Canada. There are many who have been part of EMS over the years and I'm confident that you will find support from them in your new role. Our prayer for you is that God would bless you with a sense of purpose, with confidence, and with a delight in seeing how God is using EMS uh, to bring missiologists and practitioners uh, together across Canada. Uh, so Pastor Nari, you're taking on a very uh, prestigious title, but I know it's coming with a very low bank account. Uh, like the Tim Center, we operate on fumes. Um, but uh, so we're praying God's blessing upon you. For those in the other parts of Canada, let me just read. Pastor Nari Santos is part time senior pastor at Green Hills Christian Fellowship in Peel in York. He recently planted a saddleback at South Manila Church. I think uh, it grew to about 500 in three years. Before Saddleback, he ministered in Green Hills Christian Fellowship in different pastoral responsibilities for 20 years, including helping plant six churches in Canada and four in the Philippines. He also served as adjunct professor in diaspora missiology at Tyndale Seminary. He holds doctorates in New Testament and Philippine studies, and he's also contributed and edited books and academic journals and wrote several books including Slave of All, The Paradox uh, of Authority uh, and Servanthood in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, so Pastor Nari, I just, if you can give a, a brief greeting and then would you pray for Dr. Uh, Waba's second session. Thank you. Thank you very much for being part of the EMS family. I'm also very excited about what is about to do some more. He has done great and mighty things in the past year with EMS. And we know that God has a big mission for us here in Canada. And thank you for the partnership that we have one with another as missiologists, as practitioners, as people who are interested in the mission of God. So would you join me as we pray for uh, Dr. Wafik Waba. 
Father, thank you for the joy of being part of your family. Thank you for the privilege that you want us to be on mission with you. Thank you that your mission is from everywhere to everywhere. But thank you that you have Canada close to your heart as the place where representatives of different nations have come for us to reach, for us to minister, for us to serve. And even as uh, Dr. Waba comes to speak for the second time, would you give him your empowerment from your spirit? Thank you for the turning points in historical encounters that would be so critical in reaching out to Muslims in a strategic way. Would you empower him? In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's welcome Dr. Waba. Thank you so much, uh, Santos. Uh, Robert, I think you have my hand, uh, my uh, notes, so I <laughs> we need. I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I thought I will need them for. Uh, I want to thank Robert for all the uh, hard work the last, I don't know how many months, four months, six months, maybe more. Uh, thank you and uh, for uh, keeping me and uh, following up in every couple of weeks and all of that. And uh, I'm really privileged to have this gathering as I look here at the room and uh, Obviously, I can't see the other sites across Canada, but probably this is the same as well. We have uh, so many, something's wrong. Nothing's wrong, you don't need this. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful to have such a gathering of uh, uh, many Christian leaders and uh, mission organization. And uh, I would say we, uh, we need each other and we need to uh, see more of, of this uh, gathering in terms of uh, cooperating and strategizing, and uh, we miss many of these uh, meetings uh, through Tim Center, and uh, I hope that we can have more of that uh, in the future as we uh, work together, strategize, and pray together for uh, God's mission. Um, <clears throat> well, as I said uh, in the first part, uh, in this second uh, uh, session, uh, I would like to focus on the uh, turning points in the history of uh, Christian uh, Muslim encounters. Uh, obviously, we are not going to cover 13th uh, century in one hour, but uh, uh, my focus here is to uh, get to some of the basic things that happen in history and uh, to learn from them and to also have some insights. And you will be surprised that actually uh, the way we live today, the way we interact with the world is not much different than before. We think we are smarter and we think we are um, more uh, aware of what is going on. But if you think in some of those realities, we are not far off from what was going on before. Of course, we have learned lots of lessons. We have come a long way, and which is good. But uh, these are very significant uh, learning uh, points in history. <clears throat> so the first encounter, which probably the most significant and usually that is the basic question. So what happened exactly during the seventh century that uh, we find what we call the Byzantine Christian encounter or uh, what I might call the Christendom uh, Caliphate or Islamic Ummah encounter in the uh, seventh century. What exactly happened during that time? I, I think we need to look at both <clears throat> the Christian as well as the Islamic uh, context in order to understand what was going on at that time. Um, Around the Mediterranean, uh, we look at the Byzantine uh, Christianity, much powerful. And now the emperor himself became a Christian. Christianity is the dominant religion. And one of the factors that happened during this time uh, was several ecumenical councils, uh, 325, uh, 381, uh, finally, five, uh, sorry, uh, three, 431 and 451, Chalcedon, significant ecumenical uh, councils and the idea of those councils was to unify the church and give the church a voice to express its faith primarily in Jesus Christ. It's a very significant, important goal. What really happened out of those uh, ecumenical councils, not just the Christian unity, which actually did not happen, or 
just one theological statement, but there was also political agenda behind it. Uh, the emperor was interested in presiding over a unified empire, not divided Christian empire. And that meant if the finding of the councils are not accepted by other Christians, those Christians will be persecuted. And that's what happened during the fifth and sixth century. So the time when Islam appeared in Arabia in the sixth century, we can easily say that Christianity around the Mediterranean basin was very much divided. Christians were persecuting Christians. And Christians in Byzantine were persecuting Christians in other parts of the Middle East. Not only that, there were significant rome constantinople rivalry. Uh, there were bishops in every one of those major territories, in Antioch, in Jerusalem, in Alexandria, in Carthage, in Rome, in Constantinople. The idea was introduced that since the emperor of the Christian empire presides in Constantinople, therefore the bishop of Constantinople is uh, having a little bit of a higher status. He is uh, one among equal, but a little bit better than the others. <laughs> and uh, that didn't sit well with the other bishops. Now the real serious problem happened in the fourth and fifth century with the bishop of Rome. The interesting thing, actually, Rome never participated in any of these ecumenical councils. Mind you, they were all in Greek. And uh, for Rome, that was a whole different discussion that was completely foreign for Rome. But Rome never actually in, in, contributed any significant uh, part to any of these theological discussions. But uh, there was that feeling that we should have a status as well. After all, it was the place where Peter came and Paul uh, was murdered. And uh, it, it has a status and should have a status. And that tension continued actually during this time. So what I'm trying to explain here, there were division, tension within Christianity. And that tension allowed for Islam to actually take over the Christian world of the Mediterranean. What about the Arabian context? Uh, one of the interesting uh, phrases used by the Arabs of the sixth century, the way they describe their territory, their land, Arabia, at that time there wasn't something called Saudi Arabia. The word Saudi came in the 20th century because the Saud family ruled over this territory in the 20th century. It was Arabia. So the Arab usually referred to their land as the island of the Arab. The word actually, we have a news channel today called Al Jazeera. The word Jazeera in Arabic means an island. So when you watch Al Jazeera means the island. Now, Arabia is not technically an island, but this word has a psychological, economic, and political meaning. It was like an island. Why it was like an island? It was different from all the civilization around it. The Persian, the Babylonian, the Assyrian, the Phoenician, the Pharaonic, the Greek, the Roman. Arabia didn't have the resources to sustain a civilization. This is nothing bad about Arabia. It's just the reality of the nature of the land. However, it wasn't really an island. And the Arabs were trading north and south. And we have records of the Arabs actually encountering the Armenian, the, the Aramic kingdom, the Babylonian, the Assyrian, the Egyptian, the Phoenician. They were part of that mosaic of cultures in the Middle East. Uh, in fact, if you read Nehemiah 3 to 6, Several times, Nehemiah make reference to the Arab, Jishim, who is actually were ruling in Jerusalem among other people during that time. So there was a ruler, an Arab ruler in Jerusalem during the exile. And the encounter between the Arabs and these various cultures of the Middle East was going on for centuries. So the point I'm trying to make here, they, wasn't, it, they were not really living in an island. 
and they encountered that part of the world, and they knew exactly what was going on in that part of the world. So once Islam established itself in Arabia, uh, 20 years after the death of Muhammad, they start looking outside. They start looking at spreading the message of Islam and the politics of Islam outside of Arabia. We have to remember something very important about Islam. Islam is a religion and politics at the same time. And there is no separation in Islam between religion and politics. So this is not bad or good. This is a reality of how Islam was structured, established. And whenever there is a spread of the religion, there has to be also the politics of Islam. So by the uh, 640s, we start seeing a significant trend in terms of moving outside the uh, uh, Arabia, so the, the map will give you the, the, the red part in, uh, in, in this map looks at the very core uh, establishment of Islam in Arabia itself. And then from there, it starts to expand east and west. So if you look carefully at this map, it is very interesting, very interesting what happened in a very short period of time. In 640, 638 to be exact, the first territory that was taken by Muslims were Mesopotamia. That is today Iraq. Uh, Mesopotamia is the Babylonian and the Assyrian kingdoms were taken by the Arabs. Two years later, 640, Jerusalem was taken. Two years later, Egypt was taken, 642. Actually, the city of Alexandria uh, was under siege for two years before it was taken. Uh, Persia, that's Iran, was taken uh, at the same year, 642. That's a significant, significant expansion in a very short period of time. The reason? All this area were fighting each other. They were divided. They were persecuting each other, excommunicating each other. Now, the trend continued to North Africa, and uh, by 750, to make the story short, by 750, we see all the land from Spain to India under the Muslim control. What does this mean? This means that two-thirds of the Christian geographical territory is now under Islam. Only one-third is left, which is Southern Europe. One-third. Two-thirds of the Christian world came under Islam in less than 100 years after the beginning of Islam. This is remarkable, very significant, very powerful. Now, each one of those events means something and has a reaction. Usually, the way I look to it, for any action, there is a reaction. So first, I will speak about the condition of the Christian who lived and the Jews who lived under Islam. And then we'll see what was the reaction from the West afterwards. Um, all of a sudden, two-thirds of the Christian world became under Islam. The impression sometimes that we get from historical book that Christianity vanished from the face of the earth. Well, that's not true. In fact, Christian continue to form the majority across the Middle East and North Africa up till, up till the 14th century. Sometimes we forgot that. We think that Islam took over, Next day, everybody became a Muslim. Well, that's not true. And we think that Muslims were about fighting everybody and killing everybody. That's not true either. There is no way on earth that a small group of Arab Muslims will go and control vast majority from India to Spain by fighting people. It doesn't work. If they start fighting locals, the locals are going to fight them back. So the strategy at that time was, in fact, they disencouraged people from accepting Islam. They didn't encourage them to accept Islam. Because by remaining Christian, by remaining Jews, they generated significant money to the state. So it was a very smart and shrewd techniques. You remain Christian, you remain Jews, we are here in control. We are the new rulers. You pay taxes, continue to do whatever you do. 
but we will need your help in terms of administrat administrative structure. We don't know how to manage huge territories and cities like that. So we need your help. So if you look at the early time of Islam, you find places like Damascus, like there was no Cairo at this time. So Damascus would be a good example of the first, because this is the seat of the caliphate during that time, where actually those who were running the business of the state were the Jews and the Christians. But the Muslims would say, well, we are the rulers. You help us. So that was the technique. Once Islam established itself, then a new process starts to be introduced. It's a process of Arabization and a process of Islamization. And gradually, the languages of this massive territory around the world start to change into Arabic. Arabic became the language of administration, of governing, of religion. And it took four centuries, up till the 10th or the 11th century, when actually, gradually, Arabic started to be the spoken language in this part of the world, not before that. And uh, just last week, I was looking at manuscripts in Cairo uh, that actually look at the scripture from the 10th to the 12th century, where the scripture was written in the original Coptic language, which using Greek letters, and parallel to it, the Arabic translation. So these were the Bibles used during the 10th and the 12th century. So that really explains the transition during that time. And other parts of the world, like Persia, for example, the Persian language is not an Arabic language. But Persia adopted the Arabic alphabet. So today, when you go on Young Street or somewhere else, you see, see, this is Arabic. No, it's not Arabic. This is Persian. But it is written in Arabic alphabet. Same thing for Urdu in Pakistan. And that was introduced very recently. So you read the Urdu language in Arabic alphabet. This, this is the process of Arabization I'm talking about. So there is a process of Islamization. At the same time, there is a process of Arabization, which again took at least five centuries in the Middle East and North Africa. And uh, again, the, the point I want to emphasize, up till the 14th century, majority inhabitants across the Middle East, at least the Middle East, not so much North Africa, were Christians. And I will explain why their number actually were reduced drastically by the 12th century and then the 14th century in the next two points. Now, what was the reaction from the West? Uh, 800, Charlemagne became the first Christian emperor in Europe. And as a reaction to what happened, and this is something we need to remember, from that point up till the modern age, from the 7th century to the 17th century, Europe lived with one reality, how to defend its borders from this massive a stronger, powerful Islamic state. This is something we don't think of today. It seems like far away from us. It seems like it's a distant history from us. But that was a significant reality for Europe. Europe lived for 1,000 years with one significant goal, how to defend its border from this massive, significant, powerful Islamic empire around it, from every direction. Well, Spain was part of the Islamic world. Sicily was part of the Islamic world. And when we moved to the Ottoman Empire, the last Ottoman Empire, Vienna became under the Islamic rule at one point. So it was very close. That was during Martin Luther's time. So it was very close. Now, what was the reaction in Europe? Forced Christianization. So for the first time in history, the Christianization of the Germanic tribes in the north and the Viking, the Scandinavian, and the further north start to happen in Europe. It was a reaction to a new reality that now we have to defend ourselves. Now we have to Christianize all of Europe, and now we have to make sure that Europe is Christian. And it did happen. By the 10th century, by the turn of the millennium, all of Europe, theoretically at least, became a Christian continent. 
and we inherited this for the next five or 600 years, the Christian Europe, including Russia. So all of Europe now became Christian, and sometimes by force. So we, we really have to understand history from that perspective or the reaction of events from that perspective. Now, as we move uh, further, we come to the second major encounter, the Crusades. And uh, sometimes we, we, we wonder why Muslims continue for 1,000 years to speak about a crusade. Why the crusades? As if it is the only event that happened in history. Well, there are some, I, I would say, different reactions, different interpretations to that event. But let us be fair to historical events. What really took place? What happened? What is, again, the Christian context of the Crusades and what was the Middle Eastern context of the Crusades? From the Christian European context, uh, Europe started to uh, develop something very unique, very interesting during that time. Uh, by the 8th, 9th century, one of the significant religious duties in Europe was to perform pilgrimages. So going to San Diego in Spain or going to St. Peter's Cathedral in uh, Rome, that is a significant pilgrimage for the Christian. But the ultimate, ultimate pilgrimage that any Christian should do is going to the Holy Land. So that became almost like an obligation of all Christians. So Christians have been going to the Holy Land, to the land that was consecrated by the very blood of Christ, visiting all the historical sites in Jerusalem, which is wonderful. Now, by the late 9th century, early 10th century, things start to change in the Muslim world. Now, we have a group of Turks, and you can see here the Seljuk Turks, they moved from Central Asia from what's today Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, all these Stan countries, they start moving into Asia Minor. And they start actually taking over Asia Minor. This is a whole different group of people, by the way. So the, the majority who live right now in what's today Turkey, the word Turkey itself, Turks, this is foreign to Asia Minor. This is not Asia Minor that Paul visited. This is not Asia Minor that John lived in and wrote the letters to the churches. So you can see here the expansion of those Turks who adopted Islam and they became so powerful. And what happened, if you look carefully here, they start actually taking most of the remaining Byzantine Empire. So what is left in the Byzantine Empire? A small part around Constantinople and Greece and small parts of Eastern Europe. So what is left in Christianity? A very fragmented, small Byzantine empire and a Western Europe basically centered around Rome. It is not a secret to say that actually the Bishop of Rome was finally happy because all these rivals are now defeated under Islam. So now we, now we are able to claim the power that we have been looking for for centuries, unfortunately. So yes, of course, Rome became powerful. There's no more rivals. They all came under the power of Islam. So the, these Turks start actually harassing the Western pilgrimage coming to Jerusalem. And in the year 1009, actually, they destroyed the Church of the Sepulchre in Jerusalem, the focal point of pilgrimage. At the same time, in a very combining situation here, a new sultan in Egypt that was ruling over Syria, Palestine, and all these territories, his name is Al-Hakim Ba'amrillah, or the ruler by God's decree. It's a kind of a interesting name, and it's, it's used in Arabic up till now to uh, indicate someone who is uh, completely out of their mind and just uh, presenting Dragonian uh, uh, commands or decrees. So this particular ruler was in a campaign of destroying anything that is Christian. 
monasteries, churches, uh, harassing, killing Christians. He orders so many bizarre things. He actually orders people to work at night and stay at home during the days. He orders so many bizarre things. So th this just happened between this particular ruler and the Turks that actually ignited the anger everywhere in Europe. So the context in Europe here, we see uh, that uh, uh, Pope uh, uh, Urban made the declaration in Clermont that for all the Christians, they should carry their crosses, meaning painting the sign of the cross and their shields, going to the Holy Land in order to capture the Holy Land from the Muslims. So that was the first invitation, issuing of a crusade. Of course, the Pope had no army to do that. In fact, all three kings, the King of France, of England, and Germany were actually under excommunication from the Pope. So if there's any hope for anyone to carry such a goal, it wouldn't have taken place. So the first crusade that we know of was an unorganized of random people frustrated with what is going on in the Holy Land. They decided actually to take it upon themselves. So they start venturing around the Rhine and Danube, uh, looting every village they find in their way, killing some Jews around the way as well. They finally arrived into Constantinople. They got some support from the uh, bishop of Constantinople, and they actually went in their way to Jerusalem, but they vanish once they start their way into Asia Minor by the Turks. Majority of them were taken as slaves, and the others were killed. So that's the first crusade that we know of. I'm not gonna go through details of every crusade, but second, third, and fourth crusades are more organized, simply because kings, nobles, knights, start actually selling their properties. They went to the Holy Land. It was considered the ultimate pilgrimage. Actually, the Pope issued a decree that this is the ultimate religious duty. And if you're not really looking for a religious duty, you can go and purchase a land in the Middle East. Of course, it's so wonderful to have a piece of land around the Mediterranean. I mean, nobody will say no to that if you are coming from Germany or France. I mean, it's way better to live around the Mediterranean. So. If you have an interest in the real estate, it will work. If you have interest in fulfilling a religious duty, it will work. So that was the goal of the second, third, and fourth uh, crusades. Now, without going into details of that, the end result, the end result, there was a kingdom established, uh, and as you can look here at this uh, uh, red area, around the southern part of what is today Turkey and northern part of uh, Syria, as well as in Jerusalem. So these kingdoms, the Latin kingdoms, were established with a king ruling and also with a bishop uh, ordering or establishing a Latin order in this part of the world. What is the result of that? What is the end result of what happened here? Uh, so before I go to the uh, alternative encounter, I, I just would like to emphasize the effect of the Crusades. What, what did the Crusades really achieve their goal? Well, it costs Europe significant human and financial resources. Significant, significant resources was wasted in these Crusades. Especially, they lasted for more than 200 years. Just imagine, every while, here is another crusade, here is another crusade, here is another encounter, here is another frustration. So it really drained the financial and political power of Europe. However, one of the very interesting things, after the Fourth Crusade, Europe started to look inward, start to take a different approach, start to evaluate its own social and cultural context. And that was the beginning of the early time of the Renaissance in Europe. And all of a sudden, Europe starts thinking, well, 
this is not going to work. We're not going to use, we're not going to benefit anything out of this. So let us look inward. Let us build ourselves inward. This is the time when cities like Genoa and Venice start to flourish as major urban cities, uh, not only for trade, but also for arts and for uh, the beginning of the Renaissance in Europe as we know it. And of course, this is the first step toward modernization centuries, way centuries later on in Europe. So it was bad and good at the same time. So the, the crusade really was a turning point for Europe that actually helped Europe to organize itself in a different way and not wasting its time and energy and effort in such crusades. Now, the effect on Eastern Christianity and Islam was disastrous. Now, up till that time, majority inhabitants across the Middle East were Christians. Muslims were actually a minority. Now, would those Christians participate with the Crusaders? They didn't. However, once the Crusaders left, the new Muslim rulers start turning against the Christians, persecuting them further. Why? Because now they start thinking, if that pattern continue from Europe, although those Christians did not really support the Crusaders, but you never know what will happen in the future. We are a minority. They might collaborate with the Christian from outside and throw us out. So that was the beginning of a systematic persecution of Christians in the Middle East. And that was number one why the Christians of the Middle East start to uh, lose their status and they became minority by the 12th century, between 12th and 14th century. For Islam, you might think, well, Muslims were able to kick the Crusaders out. They were able, they, be, they came victorious out of this. However, in fact, that was the one, number one reason that actually weakened the political power of Islam in the region. It's interesting to look at it this way. But Islamic territories didn't come powerful after that. They were weakened. Their resources were exhausted fighting the Crusaders. So from that perspective, from the Islamic European perspective, it was a lose-lose situation. They both lost. Nobody really won in that war. One thing I want to allude to, which is very interesting, while these crusades were taking place, there was another alternative encounter, I might call missional encounter and also intellectual encounter. So during this time, Francis of Assisi, a wonderful guy, he had a different approach. He decided to go for a mission to the Muslim world. And he actually ended up going to Egypt, and he met with the caliph in Egypt. Exact same time when Louis the 19th from France were fighting in Upper Egypt, in, in Lower Egypt, in the Delta. Exact same time. So you have a political power fighting in Egypt, but you also have a Franciscan mission who is encountering the caliph. He invited him to accept Christianity, which of course he uh, declined uh, graciously and say thank you. And, uh, Although he did not really convert any Muslim or any Muslim leader, at least he presented a different approach to uh, what Christians should be doing at this time. Uh, another character that I would like to mention, which is Ramon Lull, that we sometimes reflect on his ministers during this time. He lived between 1230 and uh, 1315. Uh, Ramon Lull was very much uh, interested in starting mission to Muslims. So he started a training center in Mallorca. It's an island south of uh, Spain. And he started teaching what he called geography of mission. And he started actually convincing the uh, Roman church, uh, Catholic church, to uh, train missionaries by adopting the Arabic language and uh, learning, which was refused at the beginning, but finally was approved in the uh, uh, Council of Florence. Uh, Lul ended up being stoned in uh, Tunisia, in Carthage. Uh, he had a very interesting approach to Muslims. He used to uh, uh, use uh, 
more of a polemic way of fighting with Muslims in terms of explaining the Christian faith, uh, proving that they are wrong and Christianity is right, which didn't work really. And he ended up being stoned uh, in, in Tunisia. But at, at least there was a different approach that was going on during that time. The interesting, interesting thing that sometimes we uh, don't look at it very much, there were actually lots of intellectual cooperation going on during this time. 8th century, 9th century, the city of Baghdad was built. Baghdad, by the way, in Arabic means a splendor. And it reflected the richness of the city at that time. And this is the time of Harun, Harun al-Rashid and the uh, 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 1000 night, uh, you know, the fair tale of how the caliph lived in a uh, palace that is uh, uh, covered with gold and all this massive luxury during that time. But the House of Wisdom was built at that time also in Baghdad. It was the hub of any educational, intellectual, encounter in the world. And why it worked, because everybody was participating. There were Jews, Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, they were all working together in that place. So there was no discrimination against anyone. A significant work of translation was done from Latin to Arabic, from Greek to Arabic, and it was done by the Christian and the Jews because they were the ones who understood both languages. Now by the 10th and 11th century, while the Crusades were taking place, Many of the philosophers, both in the Muslim and the Christian world, were actually in touch with each other. So I will just mention two names, Aquinas and Al-Ghazali. So Aquinas w was introduced to Aristotle actually through the Arabic that was retranslated into Latin, while Al-Ghazali in Northern Africa was actually doing the same Aristotelian philosophy introduced to him from Latin into Arabic. They both lived almost at the same time. And they contribute both in the Christian and the Muslim world with their philosophies, with their understanding of and critique of uh, Aristotle, which is very interesting. The point I'm trying to make here is, while there is fighting, while there are differences, there are also opportunities for cooperation. And the advancement of human culture and history and science and art happen when people work together, when they accept each other, and when they uh, see each other as human being, not as the infidels who should be eliminated and fought against. Let us move to uh, the uh, third encounter. This is something probably completely missed in the West. We hardly hear about it, we hardly talk about it. Last week, as I was sharing some of this in my lectures, actually students were ahead of me, mentioning the names and dates, and saying, wow, that's, that's really something. It's very alive. It's, as I said, you have places and uh, history that's around you everywhere in the Middle East. So what, what really happened during this time? I have this wonderful small kingdom of Mongolia, sandwiched between Russia and China right now. But all of a sudden it became so powerful and they start marching across Central Asia, taking every country in Central Asia, destroying everything on their way. Now, up till that point, major parts of Central Asia was still Christian and Muslim. So we have different uh, churches and monasteries around the Silk Road, around what is today Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Afghanistan, all these places, they had churches, they have mosques, they have both Christianity and Islam living together. And it started the shift, the transition from Christian to uh, Islam. Now, the Mongols were feared across the whole world, in Europe as well as in the Middle East. So the Pope starts sending uh, ambassadors, Francis Khan in particular, to the court of the Mongol Khans. The same thing happened with the caliphs. He starts sending also ambassadors, seeking treaties, peace, 
and the, the encounter actually between the Pope and the uh, great Khan is, is interesting. Pope Innocent, uh, the, the force, he sent uh, a message a, a message to the great Khan asking him to accept Christianity and accept baptism, otherwise he will uh, receive God's wrath. And uh, actually the great Khan responded by saying that God appointed him to actually establish his rule and the Pope should accept the Cain's religion, otherwise he will receive God's wrath. So it's very interesting uh, interaction here. Each one of course claiming that God is in their sight. Now, after this plea for peace, nothing really happened and the, the great Cain's were marching across the whole world, uh, literally across the whole ancient world all of Central Asia, all of the Middle East, and uh, actually the uh, missionaries, the Franciscan missionaries reported slaves from Russia, from other parts of Europe, serving in the Cannes courts in Karakum in, in Mongolia. So they arrived in Baghdad after demanding the surrender of the city. When that was not met, they literally destroyed Baghdad with all its cultural, educational, intellectual centers. So everything was gone. The caliph was murdered. It was a disastrous time. Now, here's one particular thing I would like, a very interesting, I'm sure many of you would know that, but I, I would mention that very interesting story that happened during that time. Uh, a Chinese pilgrimage by the name Marcus, he, was on his way to Jerusalem, and he stopped in Baghdad. Of course, there's no travel now with this massive destruction that's happening in the world. All the roads were closed. He ended up in Baghdad, and he was part of the Syriac church. We know the Syriac church from what is today Iraq was supervising all these 800 bishoprics across Central Asia all the way to China. And as he arrived in Baghdad, he was welcomed by the Syriacs. And later on, later on, they chose him to be the new patriarch of all the Syriac church. This is very interesting. He took a different name, Ayabullah, and he became the patriarch of the church. I'm not sure how his Syriac was, but it's an interesting to have a Chinese patriarch of the largest Syriac church in the world. It was also a political move. He can present a face to the Mongols that the Middle Eastern cannot present. So it really worked. It worked very well. He is someone from the, the region. And he will be more accepted to the Mongols, to the Khans, rather than a bishop, an indigenous bishop from there. So the interesting development that happened, that actually the caliph ask the help of the patriarch. And he asked him if he can send an ambassador to Europe, ask for the European help against the Mongol. Now we are talking two centuries after the Crusades. Now the Muslims are seeking the European help against the Mongols. So he actually sent his mentor, his teacher, by the name Bar Soma. He was sent to Europe, so he went he represents now a Chinese presiding in Baghdad for the largest Syriac church in the world, going to Europe as a missionary from the Islamic Caliph asking the European help against the Mongol. What an interesting scenario here. Talking about international relations in the 14th century. So he went to England, he went to Rome, he went to France, he went to Germany, he was welcome by all these kings and nobles, and they were delighted to hear that there are Christians in the Middle East, as if they didn't know that, like, you know, Christian vanish all of a sudden or something. And they promised the help. The caliph was so pleased. He actually started attending the church in Baghdad. He started giving all the support for the Christians, anticipating the help from Europe. A year passed, two years passed, three years passed, nothing happened. So it became obvious that actually the West is not interested. And the West thought, well, 
When the Mongols arrive, we'll deal with them. But for now, let the Muslims deal with them. So finally, 12, uh, uh, sorry, 1460, the Mongols were stopped in Lake, uh, 1260, I'm sorry, in Lake Tiberias, and uh, that's in Palestine, Israel, and uh, that put an end to their aggression and uh, expansion around the, the area, and uh, from that point on, uh, the Mongol start to disintegrate, and it's a long story, of course, it took two centuries for this massive uh, super state to disintegrate and to disappear. But the point I want to emphasize here as a reaction, many of the smaller Khans, the El Khans, as they call them, of the Mongolian Empire, they start adopting Islam. The interesting scenario here, some of them actually adopted Christianity. Some of them were baptized as Christians. But the majority adopted Islam. And by the 13th century, most of the Mongolian became Muslims. Sorry, most of the Mongolian rulers, not the Mongolian as people, became Muslims. So what we are looking at, the most significant super Islamic state in the history of that time. You might think and say, well, this means that Islam became so powerful if the Mongolian became Muslims and all of Asia is now under Islam with the exception of India and the smaller parts of southern, uh, actually the majority of China was under their control. That's why China started building a wall after that. That was the beginning of the idea of building a wall. We have to protect ourselves from the Mongolian, of course. Now, the rest of the Middle East and North Africa is under Islam. Spain is under Islam. This is the super Islamic state that ever existed. However, that state became so weak, fragmented, and by the 14th century, it completely disappeared. Uh, which is a very interesting development. The same pattern that happened during the Crusades. While it might look politically, militarily, that Islam became a super state, but economically, socially, the structure within the state is so weak, and that's why it collapsed. Um, one major thing that happened during that time, that was the time, 14th century, when we have a turning point in the religious interpretation of Islam. Before that, there was a time of collaboration. There was a time of learning. There was a time of seeking understanding from others and collaboration between the Christian and Jews and Muslim and Buddhists around the world. By the end of the 14th century, what is called in Islam ijtihad, which means uh, methods of interpretation that is using the human mind and capabilities of interpreting the religious law and structure was shunned. And that started or ushered a new era of conservatism. So everything now has to be according to a conservative structure. And that will help us understand the development that happened in the next five centuries, where now Islam starts moving further and further toward conservatism in its interpretation of religious structure and religious laws. Very quickly, I want to touch on the last two points. We have only 10 minutes left. Um, 15 to 15, 15, 16, 17th century, we have the encounter in what is what we call the modern age, but before that, the age of discovery. Between the 12th century and the 15th century, as I said earlier, Europe started to look inward. Europe started to organize itself inward. Europe started an era of Renaissance and the scholasticism from the scholarly point of view. And then finally, we have the era of the Reformation in the 16th century. All these pieces resulted in what we call the modern age in 1790s or 1750s, if you will. But before that, we have a significant time of discovery. What happened in Europe, starting from Portugal and then Spain, 
Portugal, now Spain was retaken in the Reconquista, while actually Istanbul f fell into the Islamic power. Exact same time, 15th century. But once Portugal start to establish its power around the world, Europe start to control the naval trade routes around the globe, avoiding going through the Islamic empire, avoiding the Silk Road that goes through Asia. And for the first time, the Portuguese were able to arrive into India and China by sea. At the same time, Columbus start navigating to the west, to the open sea, hoping that he will arrive in India. So when he arrived <laughs> in the Caribbean, he thinks he arrived in India. That's why the natives are called Indians. So with these two major events, Europe is now having control to the rest of the world. Interestingly enough, the Muslim world, if you go back to the previous map, they should have more power, but they were not. They were very fragmented. So what happened here, Europe has the upper hand through the Portuguese and then the Spanish, and then of course later on the Dutch, and later on the French, and finally the British. So all through these times, there is a control around the coast of Africa and Asia. To the surprise of the Portuguese, and later on the Spanish, they find Muslims everywhere. Muslims were dotted actually the cities around the west and east coast of Africa, and as they arrived into what is today Indonesia and the Philippines, there were Muslims there, and they called them the Moors. Well, the Moors is from the word coming from Morocco, but there is no Moroccan in the Philippines. It is just the Moors is the term that is used everywhere you find Muslims, they are Moors, because they were, that's the encounter between Spain and North Africa in Morocco. So what do you do with these Muslims? Fight them, burn their cities, destroy them. It wasn't really a pleasant encounter. And as we move through the modern age, of course, the West had the upper hand through all these encounters, and it would be beyond our discussion today to say that, in fact, all the development that happened in, in Southeast Asia and South Asia, we'll look at this in the next hour, uh, it started at this point. And when you think of Indonesia as the largest Islamic state today, number one reason for that is the way the Dutch actually dealt with the Indonesian during that time. Could have been a different story. Well, the fact that the Philippines is now the largest Christian nation in Asia has also to do with that, because it was Christianized, sometimes by force. And same thing that happened in Latin America and, of course, in uh, North America. One last thing I would mention is by the 19th century, every Muslim territory, this is the last Islamic empire, but uh, by the 19th century, every Muslim territory, we'll start with this in the next hour, from Morocco to Indonesia became under one form or another of Western colonialism. So you really have to keep that in mind and you have to understand the history of the 20th century from that background. But I will conclude with this. This is the last Islamic caliphate or Islamic empire, the Ottomans. Again, the Turks, the, the group of people that moved from Central Asia, they took over Asia Minor, uh, they became so powerful. And after the, the significant destruction of the Mongols, they start to organize themselves, they became so powerful, and they start taking over all the Muslim world around the Mediterranean, North Africa, as well as Eastern Europe. So the expansion now started to be inside Europe. Logically, they should have taken over all Central Asia. They should have expanded their kingdom all the way to China. That, that's logical, didn't happen. Now, their goal was to reach Europe. Now, the last Ottoman Empire, that, it, it really was a significant time. I took almost 500 years. Um, the Ottoman Empire, same scenario that happened during the Crusades, same scenario that happened with the Mongols, 
by the, by the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century, the Ottoman Empire started to disintegrate. And why they start to disintegrate? Europe became more powerful militarily, organized administratively, and economically. Without planning, without organization, without having a structure, you cannot keep an empire. So the Ottoman collapsed at the beginning of the 20th century. After World War I, the Ottoman Empire collapsed. And 1790, 1797 is a significant date because Napoleon was able actually to cross the Mediterranean and invade Egypt and control it for the first time. So this is the first time since the Crusaders we have a European power controlling the heart of the Muslim world. And that trigger a chain of events where later on during the 19th century every territory in the Middle East and North Africa became under either the French or the British. And the trend continue 19th and 20th century. This is, will be our discussion in the next hour. But uh, we really need to understand that every historical turning point, every reaction has an action. And we need to learn from that history. Yes, Europe became powerful. Yes, Europe had the upper hand. Can an empire continue to rule forever? Can a nation become so powerful or a super state forever? These are very significant historical events. And it helped us to understand maybe some of the history that we have right now. Thank you. Yes, uh, we'll just leave it to the other sites uh, to sign off, but we're, we'll continue with uh, uh, a few questions here as we're waiting for uh, dinner here at uh, Tyndale. So uh, let's take a few questions. Just an observation that uh, kind of as you're going through that overview, a lot of those empires lasted roughly in terms of peak power about 200 years. Mm -hmm. So here we are in North America. Um, so we're getting close to the 200 year mark and with changes that are happening south of the border of us, uh, there is definitely some signs that we are, and not that we haven't been saying this for decades, that we are in decline. So um, one, how, how do empires that are very used to holding power for so long, such as we have here in, in North America, learn to graciously relinquish that power? Um, and, and where does the locus of power, do you think, go next? I, I cannot claim to be an expert in that or <laughs> predict the future. But um, one thing, if you look to history, uh, we, we covered uh, era roughly between first century and 20th century. If you look actually in the previous times, uh, there are kingdoms who lasted for four millennia or three millennia, much, much longer time. So if you follow that pattern of history, that you can see the time is shortened. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are coming to that time when it is going to be very short. So what, again, I'm not predicting what will happen in the future, but I would say I don't think we're going to have other empires in the world. I don't think we're going to have other places where the power is going to shift somewhere else. I think what will happen is going to simply disintegrate. So what, what we have here is a continuous disintegration. 